Hi everyone, my name is Margaret and I'm with the Youth Action Lab at the University of Virginia. Here with me are Ariana and Juliana, and today we are going to discuss YPAR. You're probably wondering, what's YPAR? Before we get into it, let's start with the basics and talk about what these four letters stand for. Let's start with the R. The R in YPAR stands for research. When you hear the word research, what do you think of? Maybe you're picturing something like this, a man in a white lab coat looking at different colored test tubes. In reality, research is so much more, and it's done by diverse groups of people in many different fields. The research we focus on in YPAR is social science research, meaning we study ourselves, our relationships, and our communities. The Y in YPAR stands for youth, meaning you. In YPAR, youth are the scientists engaged in research. They pick an issue of interest in the community and create high-quality research about it. Youth also get to work with adults to make their research plans a reality. The youth and adults share power and work together throughout this process. The P stands for participatory. Youth get to steer the ship in YPAR and are actively participating by deciding on the topic to study, collecting data, and analyzing the results. Lastly, the A stands for action. This means once the research has been completed, the youth get to do something with what they've learned. They go out into their communities and make a change based on the information they now have. It's not just about the research, it's also about what the youth choose to do with the research afterward to create a positive impact. So that's YPAR, Youth Participatory Action Research. And today we're going to learn a lot more about what this looks like. Hi everyone, I'm Ariana and I'm gonna share more about the Youth Action Lab. We are an initiative of Youth Next and the Equity Center at the University of Virginia. The Youth Action Lab partners with local teachers, schools, and youth serving organizations to train and support youth, particularly those from historically marginalized communities, to use research to improve their lives by promoting equity and inclusion. Our goal is to support as many young people as possible in doing social science research to make their schools and communities more equitable. As we mentioned earlier, YPAR is an approach to research that prioritizes young people's voices in identifying issues in the community and translating them into action. This process is in collaboration with trusted adults who support youth from the beginning to the end. Now let's talk about exactly what goes on in the YPAR process. Building your team is the first step of YPAR. By building, we mean identifying your team members and then forming relationships with them. For example, a YPAR team could consist of a teacher and their students along with college students from the Youth Action Lab who all meet weekly after school. Once the research team is formed, you can then focus on identifying issues the team wants to address. This process, like all steps of research, can differ based on the team you have, the community you're in, and the resources you have available. It's important to understand your community and recognize there are often social, historical, economic, and environmental reasons for why these issues exist. After deciding on which issue or issues to focus on, the next step is designing the project. We'll talk more about different research methods later, but for now, know this step involves choosing research questions and how you want to answer them. With YPAR, it's also important to be able to name why you're conducting this research project. Who are you trying to serve? How can your project help you reach those goals? The team's next step is collecting data. The step may involve recruiting people to be a part of your study to contribute their thoughts, or reading newspaper articles and city council reports about issues occurring in your town or city. After you have data, the next step is analysis. This can look different based on the type of data you have and what tools your team has access to, but the ultimate goal is to make meaning of the data you collected in order to understand how to reach a solution or make effective change. This can look like calculating basic statistics to report how many people responded or looking for patterns across interviews. Once you analyze the data, you will then pull it all together and think about how to share your findings to inform solutions to the issues identified in step one. Your action could include creating posters or flyers to share your findings at school, creating a video to tell your community about your research project, or even making recommendations or giving a report to your school board or city council. Following this action phase, you and your team can use the skills you learn to continue working as social change agents in your community. More specifically, YPAR projects can contribute to building a culture of ongoing youth engagement and perspective on civic affairs. Even when YPAR projects are completed, taking the time to do this last step of reflecting is important. Reflecting on how the process went can be a great way to recognize what your team accomplished and think of considerations for the next YPAR project. This is where the repeat comes in. Sometimes after finishing a project, new ideas start to bubble to the surface. If possible, follow where they lead and start another project. 
Hi everyone, it's Juliana. Now that we've gone over the YPAR process, let's talk a bit more about conducting research ethically. When planning your research project, it is important to think about protecting your participants from harm. As researchers, your team may be required to have an IRB, or Institutional Review Board, review your project to ensure your research participants are protected. Some ethical concerns that commonly come up in research include, one, informed consent. Informed consent guarantees people understand the purpose of the research, are not forced to participate, and can stop participating at any time. Two, confidentiality. Confidentiality means protecting information about who participated in your research study and the information they shared while participating to protect people's privacy. And three, no long-term harm. While it is acceptable to cause people minor discomfort during the research, no lasting physical or psychological harm should occur. With these principles in mind, you will be able to carefully and effectively move forward knowing your research will be in everyone's best interest. Now let's talk about research methods. There are two main types of research, qualitative and quantitative. Each approach focuses on different types of data, but they both provide insight into important research questions and are often combined for YPAR projects. At their core, qualitative research methods center on the textual data that comes from what people say. YPAR teams typically use qualitative methods to get a more in-depth understanding of a group's experiences or opinions about a topic. Common qualitative data methods include observation, for example, observing where students sit in the cafeteria, and interviews, such as interviewing a group of students about proposed changes to school rules. Quantitative research methods center on data that can be represented in number form by using statistics. These methods also shed light on participants' feelings and opinions and can be used to show differences and similarities between groups. Quantitative data can be collected using a survey to learn what students think about their arts program or by quantifying how many people attend city council meetings each week. Mixed method research is when qualitative and quantitative methods come together. This can be done simultaneously or at the same time or sequentially, meaning one type of research follows the other. For example, a YPAR team could hold a focus group of students to hear their thoughts about potential changes to school policies, draft a list of common responses, and then administer a survey to the whole school to get their thoughts on those policies. When thinking about research methods that make up the R of YPAR, what comes to mind? While you may be familiar with surveys asking you to rate how you feel about certain things, such as the quality of food served at the cafeteria or effective homework and studying habits, there are many other ways to collect data. We discuss some of the most commonly used research designs in YPAR in the next section. Since there are a lot of research methods, sometimes it's hard to know which one to choose. While there are many factors that go into a choice, there are two that are very important to consider. First and foremost, knowing your research questions can help with the decision. If you're interested in reporting on the percentage of people in your community who feel a certain way, a survey might be best. But if you're interested in getting in-depth knowledge about how students feel about their athletic program, individual interviews may make more sense. The other important consideration is your team's ability to use a method. While there are no perfect researchers or research projects, knowing what resources your team can use to collect and analyze data prior to choosing a method will ensure you use your findings effectively later on. Lastly, YPAR projects can feature more than one research method. This allows us to have multiple sources of data. Regardless of which research method you use, after you collect data, it is important to understand what your data are or are not saying about your issues of interest. This is called data analysis. Data analysis is defined as the process of organizing, transforming, and representing data. Your approach to data analysis depends on your research questions, the methods you use to collect data, and the resources you and your team have available. While some teams use software or other applications to analyze their data and graph their findings, others make sense of it by doing calculations and identifying patterns by hand. Both approaches are great ways of making meaning out of your data to share with others and inform actionable steps, the two main goals of data analysis. Now that you're familiar with ethics, different types of research methods, and data analysis, let's dive in deeper and talk about the specific research methods youth learn about and use in YPAR. First, interviews are a commonly used research method in YPAR because they allow youth to gather information about an issue, including its context, causes, and possible solutions. Before conducting interviews, you have to think about what format you want to use. First, what are you going to ask in the interview? 
Unstructured interviews are kind of like a conversation and are used to explore a topic of interest, while semi-structured interviews use a list of predetermined, relevant questions in order to dig deeper on a specific issue. Next, how many people are you interviewing at a time? Individual interviews are one-on-one and good for exploring one person's opinions, while group interviews allow a small group of people to discuss their opinions together. These are all things to consider when planning interviews. Once the interviews are done, how do researchers go about analyzing the data? Like we touched on earlier, this data is qualitative, meaning a non-numerical, spoken or written description of something. Researchers usually transcribe the interviews into a written format and then use coding to make sense of all the information they have. This means making summaries of what has been said and drawing out themes that are present in the data. For example, if a group decided to conduct their YPAR project on healthier school lunches, they may decide to conduct semi-structured interviews with administrators, cafeteria workers, and students. They would then look through the interviews and look for emerging themes, as shown in this colorfully coded example. This could then be used to inform the student researchers on the issue and its possible solutions. Observing is probably a skill you use in your day-to-day life without even thinking about it. However, it's also a research method we train and use in YPAR. When observing, it's important to really listen and watch what's happening around you. Use all of your senses. Don't just focus on what you want to see. It's also crucial to be unobtrusive, meaning you don't interfere. Instead, sit back and take high-quality notes so you can get accurate data. One example of observation is a YPAR project conducted in high school, where students decided to study how teachers in their school could teach more effectively and keep students engaged. In this project, the students were trained in research methods and then became classroom observers. They sat in on teachers' classes and took notes on what the teachers were doing well and what they could improve. Later, they met with teachers and administrators to present their data and make recommendations. This is just one example of how observation can be used in YPAR to generate data and make a change. Next, we have surveys. Surveys are a method used for getting information from multiple people at the same time. They can be done using a pen and paper or can be administered online. Surveys are used to get feedback, generate ideas for research projects, or just see where the community stands on a topic. The first step of a survey is identifying whose opinions you'd like to know about. This means thinking about who you'd like to hear from. Your classmates? Your families? Other people in your community? Answering this question helps researchers have ideas about the next step, identifying questions. Researchers usually feature two types of questions on their surveys, the first being forced choice questions. Forced choice questions require people to respond using options we as the survey makers have already chosen. For example, a project interested in city parks might ask community members on a scale from very dissatisfied to very satisfied, how satisfied are you with your local park? In contrast, open-ended questions ask respondents to provide their own answers to questions like, what changes would you like to see in the park? Researchers often use both in a survey to have a wide range of data. After creating the survey, the next step is to recruit people to complete it and analyze your final results. This allows your team to take action and share what you found with your groups of interest. Photo voice is another way that youth engage in the research process. After deciding on the topic of interest for their YPAR project, youth go out and take pictures of the issue in their community. For example, a student could take a picture of a biker on a busy road to advocate for more bike lanes in their city, or take pictures that show the lack of affordable housing in their city. When capturing these images, the topic of ethics and consent is especially important. The researchers have to remember to be respectful, have consent to take the pictures, and have any individuals in the photos sign a photo release. Once the photos have been collected, they then spend time analyzing and creating captions that explain the pictures and the issue. In photo voice, youth can visually represent the issues they notice in their communities. They engage in discussions about their images, which allows them to truly analyze what changes could be made. Then, these images can be shown in support of their argument. For example, in the bike lane example, students might present their images at a city council meeting to try to influence policy and make their voices heard. When doing primary source research in YPAR, we have the opportunity to collect our own data and analyze our results. Secondary source research is done when we get data from pre-existing sources, like books, research articles, websites, and reports. We do secondary source research for a number of reasons. Looking at previously collected data gives us background about our issue of interest and gives important context to our project. For example, 
A group of students interested in improving community access to healthy food could look up statistics showing the amount of grocery stores within their neighborhood. Secondary source research can also be done when we are unable to collect data on our own. It also provides insight into research gaps or areas where data has not been collected on a certain issue and can help us make sense of primary source findings. When doing secondary source research, it's important for YPAR teams to consider the following for each source. Relevance, how important and useful is the information for our research project? Accuracy, does the source contain factual, recent information that can be verified by consulting alternative and or primary sources? Bias perspective, what is the author's perspective or position about the data? And last, reliability, how trustworthy is this information? Have you ever used social media? If so, you're one of 3.8 billion people in the world who do. Social networking sites and other digital spaces where people share their thoughts, information, and engage with each other are resources we can use when doing YPAR. Like other research methods, social media can act as a source of data. Researchers can look at websites featuring blog posts, forums, photos, tweet exchanges, and even more to learn about different perspectives. Social media can also be a platform for others to get involved with your project. Your team can make posts to recruit participants outside of your networks to do things like complete surveys and join focus groups. It can also be a way for an, a community to engage with the project in real time. For example, if a YPAR project was centered around safe transportation options to and from school, researchers could create a hashtag like hashtag safe roads, safe students, and encourage discussion online between students, community members, and school officials to generate ideas to solve this problem. Lastly, Using this medium can be a great way to document each step of your YPAR projects and amplify your results. Not only is it helpful to take note of what was done and what was learned from the process, sharing allows you to reach a wider audience with your message and inform next steps. Now that you have been introduced to all these different research methods, let's look at some real world examples that illustrate the power of YPAR. Hopefully you will come away with some ideas about how you can also dive into your own communities and make change. The first example is from Generation Citizen. In this example, a group of fourth graders from Brooklyn, New York, participated in a month long class project. The students started by describing their community and the issues they were interested in addressing. The students used research, including creating a class survey, learning about decision makers, and debating community issues and possible solutions to collectively decide which issues to address. As a class, they decided to focus on two issues. One, addressing the graffiti in the school's bathrooms, and two, cleaning a nearby canal. The students then took action on each issue. For the school bathroom initiative, students met with the principal, which led to the bathrooms being repainted, and they used their time in art class to create signs to encourage their peers to keep the bathrooms clean. For the canal project, the commissioner of the Department of Sanitation responded to the letter students sent to the mayor and invited the students to join in a cleanup day. These young students were able to find their voices through this impactful experience and will continue through their academic journeys as strong and empowered agents of change. Are ideas already coming up in your mind? What are some big takeaways from this particular example? Let's look at one more to keep the momentum going and see what other ideas and tips you can gain. Here's a recent example of a YPAR project from our local area. In July 2018, Albemarle County Public Schools offered a group of students a unique opportunity to create a new anti-racism policy for the school division. Eight high school students from three high schools volunteered to participate. Working with the support of a facilitator from UVA and ACPS staff, students identified how racism operated in their schools and brainstormed various ways the policy could address it. In thinking about how to design the policy, students reflected on and discussed their own experiences with racism at school and also reviewed division equity data. The students used both qualitative and quantitative data in their YPAR project. They created several surveys and held multiple dialogues with teachers and community members to collect feedback on anti-racism policy. Finally, the students presented the final policy draft to the school board and worked with division staff to finalize the policy, making sure that it still reflected the students' perspectives. The school board officially adopted the anti-racism policy in March 2019. Through their hard work and research, these local students learned about the benefits of civic and political engagement and saw firsthand how their voices can produce change.
In the Youth Action Lab, we're passionate about YPAR because it's proven to have such positive impacts on individuals, groups, and their communities. First, let's talk about the individuals. Studies have shown that after participating in YPAR, youth feel more agency or feelings of being in control of their lives and decisions, which can lead to increased motivation to influence their communities. Also, they have improved leadership, decision-making, problem-solving, and presentation skills. YPAR has even been linked to better grades and attendance in school. Next, let's talk about the group of people participating in YPAR. YPAR creates an inclusive group atmosphere where all voices are heard, and further, it gives voices to students who may not typically have the opportunity to create change in their communities. It promotes equity as students study the social justice issues surrounding them and relate them to their own experiences. It creates interactions between youth and adults who are sharing power and working together. And lastly, it expands youth social networks as they learn and grow with peers that have similar interests to them. Finally, let's talk about the community level. YPAR projects produce high quality research that can lead to real important changes. One reason that this research is so meaningful is because youth are studying issues that directly affect them. Therefore, they're like insiders into fields that may be harder for adults to study. For example, if a team of adult researchers wanted to study topics such as bullying or dating in high schools, it might be difficult for them to find a way to collect data that fully reflects the experiences of youth. However, if youth decide to study these topics, they have insider information because they have access to these topics all around them. Therefore, YPAR projects can lead to important discoveries, and the actions created during these projects can have long-lasting impacts on the community. After watching this video, you've learned about youth participatory action research and how you and other youth can be engaged researchers who identify issues in your communities, conduct research to learn more about them, and translate this work into meaningful action. We at the Youth Action Lab look forward to seeing the projects you create.